Jan, welcome to the show. Um, awesome to be here. Great to have you back. This time we get to do it one-on-one, uh, which is nice. It was great having you and uh, Daniel Kahneman on. And uh, you and I have been speaking for a long time, since 2015, 2016, about the possibilities for artificial intelligence. And I think there was like a quick moment where everyone started talking about crypto, but now I think we're we're focused on the right stuff again. <laughs> yeah, it was a distraction. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about the wave of uh, generative artificial intelligence that we're seeing and how that might relate to general intelligence. Uh, so look, I, I think when we were, were talking for the first time, we were talking about how can we make a machine that looks like and that thinks like a human. And you had told me, okay, there's going to be a time where they start to predict. And if they can predict, they can plan. And that's how we're going to get close to artificial intelligence. And I said, okay, that sounds nice, Jan, but that's never going to happen. At least that's what I was thinking. Now we're starting to chat with some of these advances like chat GPT. And I'm starting to think, oh, okay, maybe it wasn't that far off. So where are we now in terms of the pursuit for artificial general intelligence? And is this a step, a big step forward towards that? Or is it, again, maybe a distraction? Uh, the short answer is it's not, it's not a particularly big step towards, uh, you know, more like human, human level uh, intelligence. I don't like the term AGI, artificial general intelligence, because I think human intelligence is very specialized. So if you want to designate uh, the type of intelligence that we observe in, in humans by general, that's a complete misnomer. So I, I right. you know, I know maybe that chip has sailed, but, uh, but uh, I want to make that point that, that human intelligence is actually very specialized. So no, the answer, the short answer is, uh, uh, so first of all, from the scientific point of view, uh, chat GPT is not a particularly interesting scientific advance. Of course, we don't know all the details because OpenAI has not published any. But uh, Which is from interesting what we know, for a company called OpenAI. Yeah, right. No, it's the, it's the least open that you can imagine. Um, <laughs> but uh, they started out as wanting to be open, and then they realized they couldn't fund their research unless they went slightly secret, secretive. So, by uh, the way, can, can we just pause on that because that's interesting? Yeah. What does that say about the the AI research world? That if you wanted to start out as open, and you couldn't, you had to go for profit. Now they're like cat profit. Is that, is that, it's interesting that, that it's impossible to fund this type of research without that. And does something structurally need to change because of that? Well, there are a lot of nonprofit uh, AI research organizations, right? Called universities. Uh, <laughs> but there are also uh, other nonprofits like, um, you know, the Allen Institute for AI, for example, is nonprofit uh, in, in, in Seattle. Uh, OpenAI initially was, was nonprofit and then switched to for profit. Um, and originally was publishing everything they were doing and now kind of basically keep everything secret. They've, they've become sort of a contract research house for, for Microsoft to some extent. Um, and it's because okay. the, the funding model is not clear. Um, there's a, you know, uh, a reverse phenomenon that occurred at Google when uh, I created FAIR nine years ago. We, uh, you know, had a big drum roll about the fact that we we're going to be completely open, et cetera, and we still are. We are holding that line. And as a result, it caused uh, Google Brain uh, at the time to become much more open than they were. Um, Interesting. Because uh, that's what the scientists wanted. You know, yeah. if, if you, uh, you tell a scientist, you can come work for us, but you can't say a word about what, you, what you're doing, you're killing their career. So, um, you know, so you have to basically buy their life, right? So, and open research is much more efficient. You just get more more stuff out of it. You get things that is more reliable, uh, you know, and and you attract better people. Uh, you you have you know a better intellectual impact, which is which means people have kind of more respect for you and want to work for you and things like that, right? So there's a lot of advantages to this, but there has to be an economic model, and the economic model. The only one I know outside of uh, universities and philanthropy is uh, industry research lab inside of a large company that has that is profitable and is uh, sufficiently well established in its market that it can think for the long term and invest in fundamental research. So, um, so that's the case for you know certain corners of Google. That's the case for Fair at uh, at Meta, uh, and. Not quite for DeepMind. So DeepMind was an interesting 
uh, thing because they started out as a startup and you can't, you can't absolutely cannot do research in a startup. You just can't because you just don't have the, the funds, right? Or Which the ability to the wait long-term. Long term. That's right. For a return. And so, you, you know, you can do, you can do it for two or three years, but then you basically have to focus your entire attention to, uh, you know, building products and, and getting revenue and getting the company to survive. So what allowed them to do what they're doing is that they got bought by Google. But then, still then, after that, their economic model was not obvious because they were kind of sort of an ivory tower separated from Google, and to some extent they still are. And, and so, you know, Google was, had the foresight to fund them regardless of whether they were producing something that was useful. Uh, but in the current context of, uh, you know, more efficiency and money saving in the tech industry, uh, that model might might have to change. I you know it's it's not clear, right? Uh, so the economic return uh, after ten years or so or nine years that uh, Google has gotten from DeepMind, you know, is not clear. It's worth their investment. So they're they're banking on like you know bigger longer investment. At Fair, the the business model is very clear. Like Fair had a, has had a huge impact on on the company, mostly indirectly through other groups, right? Because Fair does not work on products, but um, but there's been like a, a huge amount of impact. So um, long, long wider story, the, uh, open AI, um, you know, could not keep doing what they were doing, uh, unless they went commercial essentially and made, and it caused them also to make kind of wide promises. And so what they have to do to be able to raise enough money for Microsoft and others, uh, is to make very flashy demos. And so they, and they're very good at that. So they make very flashy demos. They're. Technology is not particularly innovative from the scientific point of view. It's very well engineered. So they put together, you know, large scale, scaled up system with trained with very well curated data. I mean, they know what they're doing, uh, but in terms of advance, there's nothing or well, not much. Um, right. Okay. So, but let me take say. this from, and by the way, thank you for that little uh, diversion. I think it's good. We went into that discussion of how this stuff gets funded at, and where it goes, but going back to our discussion of the march towards General intelligence, or sorry, I'll use your term, human level intelligence. <laughs> you can use it, yeah, it's okay. I'm not going to get <laughs> upset. <laughs> From a layperson's point of view, it does feel like, oh, okay, now I'm talking to AI. Now AI understands what I think and can actually draw it. Now AI can take my voice and start talking on its own. So why isn't that a step towards okay. this it human level because, intelligence? Because the understanding uh, that those, those the current systems have of uh you know the underlying reality that language expresses is extremely shallow so those systems have only been trained with text uh a huge amount of text um so they can regurgitate text that they've seen and you know interpolate for new situations uh things like that they can uh uh, you know, even produce code and, and, and stuff like that. But um, they do not understand, they have no knowledge of the underlying reality. They have no, they've, they've never had any contact with, you know, the physical world. Um, you know, if I, uh, um, if I take a, a piece of paper, let's say, looking for a piece of paper, um, and I, you know, I, I hold it like this, right? And I tell you, uh, I'm going to lift my, my hand from one side. You can exactly predict what's going to happen. Right. And for listeners, that paper is being held horizontally. And That's so, right. so when I'm you take your hand off, horizontally, half of it I'm, drops. Uh, and I'm, 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 I'm sort of, you know, with my two hands and then one hand moves away. So when one part of the paper kind of droops. Uh, because of gravity and you know exactly how it droops because, you know, you know, the properties of papers and stuff like that. Right. So, um, this type of knowledge that, that all of us have learned in the first few months of life, none of those systems have any of this, and you would think, well, but I, I could, know, I could, kind of your knowledge, right? but I could chat with chat GPT and say, what happens if I'm holding a paper with two hands and I let go with one and it will tell you it, it will droop. No. I mean, it, it, it will answer that, but you think, it, it but it might, just won't but, understand it. No, it might actually not tell you because it will depend whether it'll tell you or okay. not. It depends on uh, whether there were kind of similar situations uh, in text that it's been trained on. But okay. it's not at all. 
And I can, I can come up with, you know, a huge stack of similar situations that each one of them will not have been <laughs> described in any text. Um, so, so then the question you, you want to ask is, you know, how much of uh, human knowledge is present and described in text? And my answer to this is a tiny portion. Like most of human knowledge is not actually language related. It's okay. completely non-linguistic. Um, I don't know, you do, a, I don't know, do carpentry, right? Build a piece of furniture. Uh, your ability to predict what the piece of furniture is going to look like as a consequence of how you build it is completely non-linguistic. Okay. And everything that has involves any kind of motor control planning, things like that, that there's basically no linguistic knowledge. So now think about the entire collection of knowledge in every animal is obviously non-linguistic because they don't have language, or at least not human type language languages. You might include a few a few species like dolphins and stuff, right? Uh, now, you know, dogs and cats know a lot of stuff and about how the world works. And all of that knowledge, humans have it too, to some extent, not to the same degree, but uh, in, in, in all domains, because we're all specialized. But uh, none of that knowledge is captured by any current AI system, essentially. And that's a lot. Okay, well, let's build on that. I've, I'm just going to read the response. I asked ChatGPT, if okay, I'm holding a paper horizontally with two hands and let go with one hand, what will happen? <laughs> now, I, I'm not going to say that, that that you're wrong. Obviously, you're right. But I'm just going to read it to you for for the state, sake of discussion. ChatGPT okay. responds, if you are holding a paper horizontally with two hands and let go with one hand, the paper will tilt or rotate in the direction of the hand that is no longer holding it. Due to the unbalanced forces acting on the paper, if the paper was initially still, it will also move in the direction of the hand that let go due to the force of gravity acting on it. If the paper was moving in a certain direction before you let go, it will continue in that direction, but may also be affected by air resistance and other external factors. Okay. That, that's a it pretty sounds, cool response. <laughs> it sounds correct, and it's completely wrong. It's exactly uh -huh. wrong. It's actually the exact opposite that's, that, that's happening, right? It's not moving... Hmm. Uh, I mean, it's, it's the part that you let go that, that droops, right? So, yeah. And this is saying the opposite. Oh, that's uh, true. Yeah. 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 Yep. So, hmm. so, right. So it sounds correct. It's grammatically correct. The general theme is correct because there probably were descriptions of similar situations that the system was trained on and it kind of memorized it. Uh, and it's, it tries to adapt the, the text so that it, uh, is relevant to the current situation, but it gets, it gets it completely wrong. And, you know, it gets wrong things like, you know, comparing numbers. Um, so you tell it, you know, uh, you do a prompt, you say, you know, you know for a fact that seven is smaller than five or bigger numbers like 250 is smaller than, uh, you know, 196. And then you start kind of, you know, telling a story with, with numbers and it will assume that what you prompted it with is right. Um, even though it's false, right. uh, but you don't even have to do this, right? I mean, there's very uh, a lot of situations like this where the system will just not um, say things that are factually correct. Now, why is that? It's because uh, large language models are trained to predict the next word in a text, and they're trained on enormous amounts of text, and they have enormous amounts of memory. Um, but uh, but they basically you know, probabilistically generate the next, the next word. And then we inject that word into their context of a few thousand previous words that they've said, uh, or, or the prompt, and then generate the next word again, and then we inject that in the input, etc. There are various ways to do this more efficiently, but that's the basic, uh, excuse me, the basic idea. Um, so now the issue with this is that there is no, um, there is no way to specify a task that the system has to accomplish other than by specifying that task inside of the prompt, which is a very circuitous, inefficient, and complicated way of specifying a task. Um, it's not very controllable, okay? That's the first thing. The second thing is that system, so that system is not like optimizing uh, an objective, if you want, like trying to satisfy an objective, right? Um, it's just kind of generating one word after the other. 
And because it's generating one word after the other, it's not doing any planning. So it's not like planning to tell a story or, or an answer where there is, you know, like a, a, a kind of a, a line to the story or, you know, a set of facts and things like this. Um, it just generates one word after another. It has no capability of generating uh, commands for a tool, like say a calculator um, or anything like that, or a physics simulator, for example. You could have simulated that piece of paper and then observe the result and then kind of tell ah. you what the result was. That's what we do in our head. When we are being described this kind of situation, we have our own internal mental simulator. And because we've learned how the world works, we can simulate what, what goes on and then describe the result, right? Uh, LLMs do not have that. They don't have any internal model of the world that allows them to predict. Um, and then, uh, in addition to this, you would like, when the system produces a statement, you'd like to be able to verify that that statement is factually correct or does not, uh, you know, break any kind of logic uh, of any kind, you know, compared to another statement that was made before. And there is no way in the current architecture of those systems to do this. Um, right. And so until we, we build uh, systems that have some internal model of the world, it allows them to kind of simulate the world if you want, some way of generating actions uh, on the world to use tools like a calculator or, or something of that, or interrogating a database or a search engine. Uh, uh, and an objective that it has to satisfy for the tasks that we asked it to accomplish and a method by which it can plan an answer that satisfies the objective, is factually correct or, or not, depending on the, des the desired behavior, uh, you know, and uh, perhaps interrogates the, the right sources of information. We're not going to have anywhere, anything resembling human level intelligence. Okay. And I definitely want to get to the type of research and the models that might get us there. But first, I want to talk a little bit about this hallucination that ChatGPT just had with my interaction with it, because hallucination is definitely a big issue. And I, I'll be honest, and this is embarrassing to admit as a journalist, but as I read it, I was ready to believe it because yes. it was like, oh, here's AI answering a question uh, with a somewhat plausible answer and stating it so confidently. And that is an issue with these models, right? Is that they, they do hallucinate. That's probably why we haven't seen Google bring it into search. Uh, go, go ahead. Well, that's why you haven't seen any kind of system of this type from either Google or Meta, despite the fact that they have the technology. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, uh, you know, uh, I mean, certainly, uh, I mean, you have to realize that most of the technology underlying techniques used in ChatGPT have been invented at Google and Meta. Right. Uh, uh, and the whole thing has been built with PyTorch, which is, you know, made by Meta, by Meta. It's not owned by Meta anymore, but, uh, um, but it originated there. Uh, so, for example, you know, it uses large transformers, uh, transformer architectures. Um, those were originally invented at Google. Uh, transformer themselves use uh, something called uh, associative memory. I mean, it's called self-attention, but it's, you know, basically the same principle. Those were basically proposed by Meta many years ago. Uh, they, they use self-supervised pre-training by removing words. That's a denoising autoencoder. Those are techniques that, you know, go back to the uh, 1990s or even 1980s in some cases. Uh, they've been popularized by the BERT style language models, uh, again, were proposed at, at Google. And then a number of techniques for dialog systems. So there's a very active dialog system uh, uh, research group at, at Meta that has proposed lots and lots of methods, um, which uh, inevitably, whether they say it or not, OpenAI must have been uh, influenced by. Um, and then they use a technique now, now that uh, uh, ChatGPT is uh, uh, available They're using a technique that, that is called uh, reinforcement learning through human feedback, RLHF, uh, which was proposed by DeepMind, actually. So, you know, they've done a good job at sort of integrating a lot of things that, you know, have been proposed in the literature and uh, and sort of engineering a system that kind of produces uh, uh, impressive demo. And they have to produce impressive demos because that's the economic model. That's how they're going to raise money from Microsoft and others. Whereas if you are Meta or, or Google, you could think about like, you know, putting out a system of this type that you know is going to spew nonsense. Um, 
And, you know, because you are a large company, you have a lot to lose by, you know, people kind of making fun of you for that. Uh, and it's not clear what the benefits are. Okay. There are, right. So we're still working on those things to make them useful. But and, didn't, didn't Meta really, put out a system of its own, Galactica? And yeah, this was so something Galactica, that was... Okay. So yeah, uh, talk us through what happened there, because this was a system that was supposed to summarize <laughs> scientific literature and do lots of other cool things. It comes out and then three days later, it goes back behind closed doors. That's right. So what happened, uh, there was an, a previous system also called Blunderbot, and there's another story about that that will- Oh, tell right. You. That's, so start, that's the thing that started talking about how Mark Zuckerberg is a sort of yeah. money-hungry capitalist. I mean, it was just reflecting <laughs> what it what it was trained on in right. the press, right? And that's basically what the press You didn't get called on into Zuck's itself, office and be like, hey, what are you, what are you guys talking, telling it about me? <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, no. It just, I mean, it just trained on the, you know, the general- Conversations. Things that you, you read oh, in the media. Yeah. And in the media, you know, Mark Zuckerberg is uh, very often painted as, you know, some sort of money hungry bad guy, which he is not at all, but that's the way he's painted. So, um, uh, yeah, so let's start with uh, Blunderbot then. So Blunderbot was, was put out and uh, several months ago, and it's a, a dialogue system, a bit like ChatGPT. It's designed to be entertaining more than anything else. And it's capable of having multiple personalities, so it can talk into like several styles and things like that. Uh, and it has provisions to somewhat verify uh, factual correctness, although not particularly well-developed. Uh, but it, we, it does have a lot of uh, kind of uh, guardrails and and, uh, and kind of systems to like prevent prevent it from you know saying things that might be offending or or whatever uh, or or even objectionable or even controversial, right? So if you try to get it to talk about anything related to politics or religion or anything like that, it will change the topic. Um, and it won't tell you it's because I don't want to talk about this. It would just change topic, right? I see. So people thought this thing was really stupid and boring <laughs> uh, because it doesn't want to talk about anything that's kind of you know, controversial or fun, which is the kind of stuff you want to talk about, you know, everybody wants to talk about. Uh, and uh, and it, it's frustrating because it would change topic any, you know, anytime you wanted to, to do that. So uh, it was not nearly as convincing, uh, but so, so you, could, you, could, you could say that the reason it was, you know, not that impressive in the end is was because it was it was made to be safe, essentially. Okay. And if, if it's too safe, it's, it's boring. Um, so um, now let's go to Galactica. So Galactica is a different animal. It's also a large language model, and that large language model has been trained on the entire scientific literature. So this is something like, you know, millions of scientific papers, and the purpose of it its use is to help scientists write papers. So think of it, so it's not gonna write a scientific paper for you. It's not going to answer scientific questions, although you could try to use it for that, uh, but sometimes it might make stuff up. But it's designed to be essentially a, a you know predictive keyboard on steroids, right? So you start typing a paragraph about something and it will, you know, complete the text, the entire paragraph, it will insert relevant citations. Uh, if you say, you know, the the uh, state of the art uh, in object recognition on the ImageNet database is, it will find the correct reference. It will actually, you know, build a, a table of results with links to the references and stuff like that, right? Uh, but the same way uh, driving assistance systems for cars are just that, driving assistance, this is just writing assistance, right? So in the end, your hands have to be on the wheels on the wheel at all, at all times, uh, you are responsible for the text that in the end uh, is finished. It just helps you, it's a tool that helps you write more efficiently, particularly if you are not a you know, native English speaker, um, which you know, most scientists aren't. Right, I mean, I um, even use ChatGPT that way. I put in the beginning of yeah. the paragraph and say, hey, which ways can exactly. this go? Understanding that it might not be accurate. And that's the way you should treat it really. Right. Um, as, uh, you know, as as a predictive keyboard on steroid, uh, and and something that just helps you write, but it's it's not gonna, you know, write, invent new things, answer questions, do science, blah blah blah. blah. So what happened was that when we put out Galactica, people tried to break it. So people who are not scientists, like didn't understand what the <laughs> use of it was was going to be, uh, and 
and they would prompt it with things like, uh, you know, what, what are the benefits of eating crushed glass or something like that? And of course, that's kind of a leading question. So the system will kind of make a story of like why it's good to, <laughs> you know, to eat uh, crushed glass. And then the reaction on Twitter was, oh my God, you know, people are going to eat crushed glass because they're going to listen to it, right? Which is, you know, insane. I mean, it's stupid. Uh, people are not that, that dumb. Uh, well, Jan, I think you overestimate people a little bit, but sorry, continue. <laughs> <laughs> well, there, there might be a tiny proportion, but like, you know, are they likely to use things like this? Not clear. Um, you know, particularly Galactica, was, which really ultimately was designed to be, you know, integrated into tools that scientists use to write papers, right? So, um, and then, you know, others more seriously said, uh, oh, this is going to destroy scientific publication because now, uh, you know, anybody can generate a, a nice sounding scientific paper and then we'll submit it to a, a conference and this will completely flood uh, and, and overwhelm the reviewing uh, system that we have in science and destroy science. And uh, I thought that was a completely ridiculous argument because the reason why you might want to submit a paper is because you want to prop up your CV. And so you have to put your own name on it. Otherwise, what's the point? Uh, and if you put your own name and it's garbage, it's bad for you. It's right. bad for your career. Like, you know, if you, if you, you know, send a hundred papers that are complete nonsense to a conference with your name on it, it's not going to be good for your career. Like, absolutely not. So, um, so I don't, I, so I think this kind of knee jerk, uh, reaction, uh, was completely unwarranted and it really mirrors a lot of knee jerk reactions that have happened in the past when new tools or new communication technologies have appeared where, you know, all of, all of them were going, was going to destroy society. So I think it's the same kind of knee jerk reaction that we're observing with, with AI today. Um, you know, this is not to, to say that there is no danger, but, um, but it's not like the horrible things that people make it to be. Right. So then why not keep it up? Well, so what happened was the team that worked on it, which is uh, within FAIR, is called Papers with Code. They were so distraught by the reaction that they just, they just, they just couldn't take it. They said, like, mm. uh, you know, we're just going to take it down. Like, this right. was not a high-level decision. This was not a decision by... Uh, communications departments or the management. This was them. Okay, it's a small team, a few people, and they felt like really good about what they had produced. They they wrote a very long paper. They open sourced their code. Uh, they took down the demo, but they left the code, so anybody can download Galactica and run it on their own computer if they want. Interesting. And this is sort of what we're going to see. I I just wrote this story, and we've talked about it on the podcast about how the the battle over you know AI ethics applications of AI is just going to be extremely intense and. I think we're starting to see some of that. So we've covered hallucination. Good. We got to that. Let's talk about the type of models that you think. So you, you talk about our move to artificial or to human level intelligence, needing an understanding of the environment, things of that, that can't be expressed with words. <laughs> now, when you tell me that I'm back to kind of where I was in the early days of our conversations <laughs> saying, there's no way technology is going to be able to do that. But it sounds like you think that there is a chance that it, can how do we get there and what type of advances are we seeing today that might lead us to think that we do have a chance so i actually wrote a position paper about this which is rather long but the intro is easily readable by non-specialists and the title of it is a path towards autonomous machine intelligence where basically i i lay out a plan or a path forward to address uh, those questions to build ai systems that are uh, capable of uh, of planning, uh, whose behavior is controlled by objectives that need to be satisfied, uh, which can be specified by hand or learned. Uh, so things like you know factual correctness and blah blah blah, and answer this question, and you know don't don't spew offensive stuff and things like that, uh, and uh, and have internal models of. The, the world or the the thing they are interacting with, which could, which could be a person. If they're if they're, there are dialogue systems, then uh, when you're talking to someone, you need to have a mental model of what that person uh, knows and can understand. Okay, if you if you speak in terms that the person cannot understand, then you know there's no, communication fails, right? So when when you when you talk to someone, you you have something to say, and you may have to tell them, you know, some background information, depending on what you think they know, and then sort of take them to the stage where 
um, uh, where, where you think they've absorbed the information that uh, you think would be useful to them. Um, so you need to talk to someone, you need an internal model of what that person, how that person will react to what you tell them. Um, and if, if it's another type of agent that generates actions in the physical world, uh, or even in the, in the digital world, like a robot that, you know, a domestic robot that, you know, needs to cook or fill up the, the uh, dishwasher, um, that model, that system needs to have an internal model of the world that allows it to predict what the state of the world is going to be as a consequence of its own actions, because that's what you need to be able to plan. If you want to plan a sequence of action to arrive at a goal, you need to be able to imagine if I take this action, this will happen. And then if I take that action, this will happen, et cetera, et cetera. And so you can optimize your sequence of actions so that uh, the resulting sequence of states that the world is going to follow is going to satisfy your ultimate goal. Um, and, uh, uh, and then the an issue with this is that, you know, how do we get a machine to learn models of the world? Baby humans and animals do this in the first few months of life, uh, mostly by observation, and understand a huge amount of background knowledge about the world, um, basically just by observation. This is the type of learning that we need to uh, reproduce in machines that we currently cannot do except for simple things like text. Because you, you have to understand mm -hmm. that text is actually simple compared to the real world. Right. So how do you do it? Okay. So um, <laughs> one proposal. Sure, it's simple. Okay. So there's one way to not do it, which is the way large language models are trained. Uh, so the way you pre-train a large language model is that you don't train it to just predict the next word in a text. You take a long piece of text, uh, a few thousand words typically, and you remove some of the words. Uh, you, you blank them out. You replace them by a blank marker, or you substitute another word, or, or you do various corruption hmm. uh, things. And then you train some gigantic neural net to predict the words that are missing. Okay? So this is called self-supervised learning. Uh, and it's, uh, this particular instance is uh, what's called a generative model, which is much more general than the usual kind of colloquial use of the, of the term generative model. It's generative in the sense that it, it produces uh, uh, signals that are the same as the input. Okay, it, it, it tries to fill in the blanks, if you want. Okay, um, so it generates the missing information, if you want. Uh, and uh, this particular instance is called a denoising autoencoder. Why autoencoder? Because you give it an input that is corrupted and you ask it to produce the clean uh, version of that input. That's called a denoising autoencoder. And again, that concept goes back to the 1980s. No, nothing new there. Uh, except the application of this idea of denoising autoencoder to text using a transformer architecture, which is those you know, very large neural nets that we use nowadays with 40, 90 layers or whatever, and hundreds of billions or, or at least tens of billions of parameters, uh, works amazingly well, like surprisingly well. So in the process of being trained to uh, filling in the blanks, those models basically learn to represent language as a series of numbers <laughs> uh, that represents the, basically the meaning of the input sentence to the extent that this meaning is useful to fill in the blanks. Okay. So inevitably, by being trained to do this, the, those systems understand a little bit about the real world, but not much. It's very superficial. You know, if I, if I train the system with sentences of the type, uh, you know, the cat chases the blank in the kitchen, you know, the blank there can only be a few things, right? It's either a, a mouse uh, or an insect of some type, or maybe a laser spot that someone is, you know, playing with a cat uh, or something like that, right? There's only a few options. And so those systems are trained to produce essentially a long list of numbers that are scores for each of the possible words in the dictionary for as, you know, how likely they are to appear at that location. And, and to be able to do a good job at this, the system has to understand a little bit about, you know, what's a kitchen and what's a cat and, you know, cat, cats chase mice and things like that. And so it learns that, but it's very superficial. Um, and, uh, <clears throat> And then what you do, once you've trained the system to do this, you chop off the top layers, and then you can use the internal representation as input to a subsequent downstream task that you can train supervised, like for example, translation, 
or uh, you know hate speech detection, for example. Um, so the, this technique has become completely mainstream in natural language processing, um, and so much so that uh, companies like Meta and Alphabet in their various services have deployed those things massively for doing things like content moderation. Hmm. Right. So uh, hate speech detection, for example, has made enormous progress over the last three, four years. And it's essentially entirely due to the fact that we're now using those techniques. OK. We can do hate speech detection in multiple languages, basically with a single model. Uh, with We don't have to train it with a lot of data in each language because we don't have a lot of data in every language. We have a lot of data in English and others and you know French and German and blah, blah, blah. Uh, you know, maybe the main language in, in India, but India has, you know, like an enormously large number of languages that people use, uh, including online, you know, and local dialects and stuff. Um, uh, so, you know, how you make the hate speech detection work in 500 languages? And even 500 would not cover everything. Uh, so you need those techniques. And, and, you know, this has made a huge amount of progress. Now, one thing you can do with those things, is you can fine tune them to just predict the next word. And that's what large language models are. Okay. Now, um, coming back to this question of, of planning, last time we talked with, with uh, Danny Kahneman, uh, uh, which was an amazing discussion. Uh, Danny is, is famous for, you know, this book, uh, Thinking Fast and Slow, and for this idea that uh, we have basically two ways of uh, uh, acting, uh, system one and system two, right? equal sense system one, system two. So system one, corresponds to tasks that you accomplish subconsciously. You don't need to plan anything. It's completely reactive. Um, so think about like, you know, you're, you're an experienced driver and you're driving on the highway. You're barely paying attention. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you, you're, you're not calling on your sort of high level cognitive functions to do that. You can do it more or less automatically. Uh, anything that involves a real time reaction, like, um, you know, playing tennis or something like that, that's mostly subconscious. You're not, you just don't have time to plan, right? So it has to be built into your muscle memory, as we call it, right? But even complex acts, like, you know, you play chess and you are a chess grandmaster, you're playing a, you know, simultaneous game against 50 bad players like me, uh, you don't mm -hmm. have to think. You can just look at the board and just immediately play. You don't have to plan anything because it's so easy for you. You know, it be, it's become kind of a subconscious task. Now, all of those things, though, all of those tasks, uh, when you learn them, or when you're not very good at them, uh, you have to use your entire cognitive uh, resources. You learn to drive, and you pay attention to everything. You imagine all kinds of catastrophe scenarios. Uh, you drive slowly. Uh, you're using your frontal cortex, your model of the world, uh, that you know tells you I'm driving next to a cliff, and I know that if I turn my steering wheel to the right, I'm going to fall off the cliff and nothing good is going to happen. Uh, you don't need to try it to know that something bad is going to happen, right? Because you have this model that you've, you've built in, in your head for the last 17 years, if you are a 17-year-old. Um, so that model of the world allows you to predict the consequences of your actions and allows you to learn extremely quickly any new skill. Um, you know, same with, with chess. Uh, if you're a bad chess player, you will have to think for, you know, 15 minutes or, or more uh, when you play against a, a challenging uh, a player and, and plan all kinds of uh, strategies. Uh, so uh, what characterizes intelligence is the ability to predict, first of all, and then the ability to use those, prediction, those predictions as uh, a tool to plan by predicting the consequences of actions you might take. Uh, prediction is the essence of intelligence. Okay, so now here's the problem. Uh, this idea of denoising autoencoder that we use to pre-train natural language processing systems works for text. It doesn't work for anything else. So it doesn't really work for things like video or images. Right? So a natural idea is you take an image, you block some pieces of it, and then you train some system to predict the, the pieces, reconstruct the, the parts of the That's how Dolly image. works, huh? Huh? That's how Dolly works. Not really, no. <laughs> okay. 
it, it, you know, it uses, I mean, DALI 2 uses a diffusion model, which is kind of a slightly different idea, but okay. it has, Get it has to that later. some connection. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, but if you do it the way I, I just described, there is like one or two models that sort of work that, that use that. One is called MAE by my colleagues at, uh, at FAIR. That means mass autoencoder. Uh, but it doesn't work as well as other techniques. And those other techniques are not generative models, okay? So they're models that do not attempt to reconstruct missing information. There are techniques that uh, attempts to reconstruct uh, missing information, but not reconstruct the image itself, but reconstruct a representation of that image, an internal representation of that image. Those techniques, I, I call them joint embedding architectures. So essentially, in the uh, you know denoising autoencoder, you have an encoder that produces produces a representation of the input, whether it's an image or text or video or whatever, and then you try to reconstruct the uncorrupted version of the input, the input being corrupted, right? That's through a decoder. In a joint embedding architecture, you have two encoders. One encoder sees the perfect version of the input; the other encoder sees a corrupted version or distorted version of some kind. You run those two things through both encoders, and then you tell the encoder that sees the corrupted input, can you predict the representation of the full input? Hmm. But you're not trying to reproduce all the details. And it makes sense for images because, or video. So let, let's imagine we're on a scenario with video, right? So I have a video clip, uh, and I have a complete video clip. And what I do is I, I mask the, the last half of the video clip, okay? The corrupted version of the video clip is just the, the first half of that video clip, okay? The rest is invisible. And then the, the complete version, of course, is a full video clip, right? So you run this full video clip through some neural net that produces some representation of that video clip, right? Uh, and then you train this guy to predict the representation that that guy has produced. And of course, implicitly, what it has to do is predict the rest of that video clip. In, but in, in representation space. Now, why is that better than just reconstructing the piece of the video clip that is missing, just predicting it? And the reason is there is an infinite number of things that can happen after mm. a particular video clip, right? Uh, and we don't know how to represent uh, a distribution of all the possible things that could possibly happen. We cannot do it in pixel space, right? So for example, uh, you know, you, you're seeing a green screen behind me right now. You're not seeing the back of my head, okay? You can make, so if I start rotating my, my head, uh, you might be able to predict what the back of my head will, will look like. And in, when you look at it, you might be surprised by what you see. Maybe I have a, a small ponytail or something. <laughs> I don't, but, you know. Um, mm -hmm. And so, and there is, a, you know, an infinite number of uh, variations of uh, what could be possible there. And I could decide to, you know, change the action and move my head in a particular way or, or something. Um, so you can't just predict every detail of what's going to happen. Let's say you want to build a, it's very important if you want to do things like building self-driving cars, because you, to be able to drive uh, safely, you'd like to be able to predict what cars around you are going to do um, or what pedestrians are going to do. You see a kid on the sidewalk and, uh, you know, a, a soccer ball kind of crossing the road, good chance that the kid is going to run after it, right? So you slow down. Um, so, you know, we, we have this sort of interesting models of the world that allow us to predict and then as a consequence plan kind of safe actions. But then in that same street where the kid is with a soccer ball, uh, it's, you know, aligned with trees and there is a pond behind the trees and it's a windy day. So the tree, you know, all the leaves are moving and there is, you know, ripples on the pond and everything. And you don't want to spend any resources predicting all of those details, which are essentially unpredictable. And so that's why generative models uh, essentially fail when you train them on, on images, because there's just so many details to predict. The system gets completely lost in predicting all kinds of irrelevant stuff, which we call noise. <laughs> uh, but, you know, how would the system know? So, uh, so one of the main thing I'm proposing in that in that piece is to abandon those generative models basically and focus on those joint embedding architectures uh, for getting models to learn system to learn models of the world, predictive models of the world.
Okay, and, and maybe that's what gets us there. Okay, let's let's take a quick break here and then come back for about 10 more minutes on, on the show. We have Jan LeCun with us. He's the VP and Chief AI Scientist at Facebook um, and known as the father of, of deep learning. So uh, plenty to talk about. We'll be back right after the break. And we're back here with Jan LeCun, the VP and Chief AI Scientist at Facebook, Facebook Meta. I don't know. Is it the same? Is it different? Meta. meta. Let's call it Meta. Um, so, two jobs, actually. I'm also a professor at NYU. And professor at NYU, right? Of course. Can't forget that. So, uh, Jan, let's let's talk a little bit. Let's just go one one level deeper about this in the time that we have left. So, Facebook, I, I know, released a, a application, or at least has it internally, where you can type a sentence, um, and, and it will make, like not like a, an image with Dolly, but like a small little video that actually resembles that sentence. So is that taking us closer to this ability to predict and understand the world that you're talking about? Uh, yes and no. <laughs> uh, so yeah, there, there is uh, two little demo applications. One is, uh, is called uh, Make a Scene, and this is one uh, you know, a bit similar to, to, to Dali, where you type a description of an image and it just produces an image. It's, it's based on slightly different ideas, but it's... Um, uh, in a way, you know, it came out before Dali, actually. <laughs> right. Um, uh, the, the main author of Dali, by the way, is uh, uh, was an uh, uh, Aditya Ramesh, a brilliant young guy who he was an undergraduate student with me and did some research uh, projects in my lab before going on to OpenAI as an intern and then being hired as a <laughs> as a, as a scientist. Um, so. Uh, so there's this thing called make a scene that produces fixed images, and then there is a similar thing called make a video that produces short short video clips, essentially. And they're kind of systems that can do this now from Google as well. And right, uh, but those cetera. they're not really sort of publicly available. Yeah, yet, you can't but... use it. I saw the blog post. I was like, oh, I want to use this, and then I realized it wasn't public. I imagine the no. problems that you had with Galactica would pale in comparison to whatever happens with this movie maker. <laughs> not no, not at so all. So then, why actually. not release it? It's less because yeah. uh, there's something with with language that people kind of, I think, you know, pay right. more attention to. No, the the, the main issue with those things thing? is, is like where where does the training data come from, mm -hmm. and, and things like that. So, uh, you know, before we can roll them out, that has to be trained on data that is um, public acceptable available. and all that stuff. Um, uh, there is a similar system also uh, in the works. Um, th there's been some publication on it uh, that can generate audio. So it can generate sound effects hmm. uh, also by textual description or simultaneously with the video. Um, there's uh, systems also um, from FAIR that uh, produce music. Uh, they can do music continuation. So it's like a large language model, but with music, right? So you feed it audio and it just continues. Interesting. Uh, uh, so you're going to see more and more of those things. And Meta is really interested in those things, in sort of creative aids, because uh, everyone who is on an online service, whether it's a social network like like you know Facebook or Instagram, or whether it's going to be you know in the metaverse, everyone is going to need to have easy ways to generate uh, content and be creative, without necessarily having all the you know being technically uh, uh, astute enough. Uh, in in terms of of art uh, to uh, to do all that thing, so, so being able to generate, you know, be creative and generate content, I think is something that's very very important. And so you you're going to see things like that popping up on you know Meta's uh, services in various uh, various interesting spaces, generating uh, images, effects, modifying images, generating video, generating music, sound effects, three D models, okay, huh. which of course is uh, important for the metaverse. Um, and, uh, and eventually, you know, all the way up to intelligent virtual characters and stuff like that. Really? Okay. So Meta is going to go in all in on this stuff. Oh, totally. Yeah. Yeah. I want to ask you a question about it because, you know, the thing about, um, you know, art, song, videos, all this stuff, it, there's a musician, songwriter, Nick Cave, who did this post about Dolly writing, I mean, not, not Dolly, um, chat GPT writing songs and the authenticness yeah. of all of it. Now there's been this debate, right, is this going to take everybody's job or is it too, too soulless and dumb to actually do this? This is sort of the argument that this AI really can't do what humans do. So this person writes, Nick writes chat GPT may be able to write a speech or an essay or a sermon or an obituary, 
but it cannot create a genuine song. It could perhaps in time create a song that is on the surface indistinguishable from an original, but it would always be, it will always be a replication, kind of a burlesque. Songs arise out of suffering, by which I mean they are predicated upon the complex internal human struggle of creation and, uh, and well, as far as I know, algorithms don't feel. So I'm curious when you, what you think about that, like from the perspective of a songwriter. <clears throat> <clears throat> okay. Can this stuff actually produce? There's, there's, yeah, there's, there's a lot of questions around this, right? <laughs> so first of all, it is true that current AI systems don't feel, okay? But it's not going to be true for much longer. So if we have systems of the type that I was describing before that have objectives and that plan actions to optimize objectives, they will have the ability to predict uh, the outcome of a situation. Which means if they are able to satisfy their goal, uh, given a situation, uh, they're going to feel the equivalent of elation. If they can predict that they're not going to be able to satisfy their goal, uh, you know, they're going to be disappointed with themselves. Hmm. If they predict that the situation may be dangerous for either themselves or the uh, person they are interacting with, they might actually have, you know, the equivalent of fear. So if you have autonomous <laughs> yeah. AI systems that work by uh, optimizing objectives and they have the ability to predict, uh, they are going to have emotions. It's inseparable from autonomous intelligence. Fascinating. Right? So maybe we'll have a, an AI that tries to fulfill some objective and fails miserably and writes a song okay. about it. And that will be... Okay, but, <laughs> but um, a big part of art, I mean, it's certainly true for songwriting, and, but also for novels and for jazz improvisation and all kinds of stuff, right, is uh, basically a vehicle uh, to communicate human emotions. And uh, Nick Cave has a point, which is that there is nothing to communicate <laughs> unless you have emotions that the uh, auditor or reader can relate to, right? So, uh, uh, and, and that really depends on the person. Like, you know, I'm, I'm totally taken by, you know, good jazz improvisation. Uh, uh, but like words on songs, like, like, you know, in the case, like do nothing to me. Like, <laughs> I mean, we have different tastes, right? Different ways of reacting to different things. But, um, so, you know, is, is right in the way that if you want a genuine experience of art, um, of communicating, uh, human, human experience or human emotions, it has to come from another human. Even if machines eventually have emotions, they're going to be very different, different from humans. So it's not going to replace. Uh, this type of uh, genuine art. It's, you know, Could you can think of this form as, of art. yeah, like, you know, project yourself like back uh, a couple hundred years ago, where like every, like you wanted to buy a, a salad bowl or something, um, it would be handmade, right? There'd be like a, a potter that would, you know, kind of make that the thing on the, <laughs> right, and just make it by hand and bake it and everything, right? Uh, as a consequence, it would be relatively expensive for most people. Um, and then and then came industrialization. So now it became possible to build, uh, you know, ceramic bowls for pennies uh, in sort of large quantities. And uh, did that um, kill the, the whole idea of making bowls by hand? No. In fact, handmade... Uh, uh, objects become more expensive as a result. Right. And that leads me to, to a question that I have to ask you, which is that everybody's asking about the training data that, that yeah. these things are using. In fact, I, I, I put a tweet out asking, Hey, I'm going to talk about generative AI. So we'll end with this generative AI ethics question. What would you like to know? Everybody wanted to know about how the people who these databases or programs are trained on are actually going to end up being compensated and whether we should actually even allow them to train on stuff that people have created without their consent. Here's like two of those comments. So, uh, Roger McNamee, an early Facebook investor now, now critic says, and he didn't know it was going to be a Facebook conversation, a conversation with someone with Facebook, but he says, um, why should it be legal for computer scientists, entrepreneurs, and investors to profit from unlicensed exploitation of the works of creative humans? And we also had one more from uh, Marshall Marr, and, and he said, the, inevitably of, the inevitability of intrusive tech is a uniquely American phenomenon. I don't know why American, but anyway, this is what he says. 
They they asked you to post baby pictures and are now training lucrative AI engines with your images. This was not disclosed at the time. Pay me now. So yeah, when when you think about that, what's your what's your reaction? Okay. And how should we it's think gonna about be a it? It's going to be a debate for society to figure out uh, because I don't think the answer is totally clear. Uh, you know, for example, uh, uh, photography, the invention of photography uh, shrunk the market for um, a portrait, painted portrait by a lot. It's not like portrait, portrait has disappeared, uh, but it certainly uh, reduced the market for it. Um, recorded music reduced the market for performance uh, musicians. And in every instance of those things, there was, uh, you know, collectives of artists to say like, you know, we have to stop this because this is going to kill our business. They were universally unsuccessful. Okay, so you, you're not going to stop technology, right? The, now the question is, is, is a legal one. So if you, if you assume that current legal uh, interpretation of copyright, if you want, uh, um, is used, then you cannot let those machines plagiarize. So if you use uh, a generative model that has been trained on whatever, and it produces, regardless of the process, and it produces a piece of art that is too similar to an existing one, the artist that produced that existing one uh, is entitled to sue the, 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 the person who is distributing this, this new piece of art. Um, uh, and and ask for compensation. Now, but what if that piece of art is not copyrighted? That generated piece of art is not copyrighted, so nobody can profit from it. Who are you, who are you going to sue? Um, you know, is is there grounds for um, for suing? Now, if again it's a copy, yes, there is ground for suing even if you give it for free. If that piece of art is in the same style as uh, a known artist, but it's not the same piece of the same painting or whatever it is. Uh, then that's where things become complicated because human artists are absolutely authorized to ins get inspired and <laughs> straight down copy mm -hmm. uh, someone else's style. Um, that happens absolutely all the time in um, uh, in art. And so would, would it make sense to apply a different rule for, let's call them uh, artificial artists, right? That, that generate things um, like, you know, they can get inspired by whatever they see they've been trained on, uh, but then they cannot just reproduce. So that would be a perfectly fine thing to do. I imagine that a lot of artists would not be happy with this, uh, but you know, that's a, that's a definite possibility. Now, uh, perhaps what you might want to do is what, you know, the early internet uh, also authorized uh, or, or put in place, which is that, you know, you can put a, a little file called, you know, robot.txt or something that uh, <laughs> tells search engines and, and crawlers do not use my content for, any, for anything. Like, you know, you can't index it, you can't uh, use it for anything. So if you're an artist and you don't want your content to be used, you know, lobby for this kind of stuff and this kind of policy to be uh, uh, to be respected by by you know calling uh, algorithm. Um, and then um, and then it could be like you know the next uh, step would be uh, like if you use my artistic production as training data, you owe me money, and I think that's a bit extreme. Mm. So, you know, the answer is probably somewhere in between and not clear what, like, and it's not for people like me to decide, like, you know, I have no particular legitimacy to like tell people this is the right thing to do. Uh, I'm a scientist, I'm an AI scientist. Um, I think this is for society as a large, at, at large to the, to decide uh, through the usual democratic process. Um, but, and, but you have to be careful, like in one of the remarks that you, you mentioned, it, it was said like, you know, why should like a large tech company in California profit from my, my art, me poor artist? Uh, this is the wrong way to frame this because within a year or two, you know, any teenager in their parents' basement is going to be able to do this. So um, you, you don't want to 
use the you know current bad press that the tech industry uh, has to motivate people to kind of go after this because that's you're going to lose if you do this. Yeah, this is not something you know. The big tech company are just the first ones to have the technology to do this, but eventually everybody is going to be able to use this, right. this kind of stuff and train their own models and crawl the internet, right? I mean, you know, countless startups and, and, and you know, young programmers. Yeah, and it is a point. I made this point in my most recent newsletter, but that we are not going to see the centralization. I'm sure you agree uh, that we saw with, with, you know, communication online, like with the Facebook and the Twitters in AI, it's going to be much more distributed. And the last thing I'll say is that I'm so torn about this because I have been plagiarized by someone using my words, feeding them into uh, generative AI systems and then publishing them as their own. That's already happened to me. However, I yeah. just love the systems. I love using Dolly to illustrate uh, my, my stories. And I love speaking with chat GPT where I mean, I have it on speed dial. It's so fun to speak with. So, okay, that 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 will do it for us. Uh, unfortunately, we're out of time, Jan. I feel like we can speak for hours each time, but unfortunately, uh, <laughs> that's the end of the show. So, thank you so much for coming on. We'll have to do it again soon. Well, thanks for having me, Alex. Okay, great. It was a pleasure. Awesome. Yeah, sorry for.